This is Dr. John Walton in his teaching on the book of Job. This is session number 17, conclusion of the dialogue series, Wisdom Interlude, chapter 28. Now we want to talk about this interlude chapter, the hymn to wisdom in chapter 28. But let's review a little bit where what has brought us here so that we can have our bearings going into it. The dialogue section is complete. Job has finished with his friends. That conversation is over. Job has not been seduced by the prospect of renewed benefits, uh, and even though that's been the pressure. And he basically has concluded that the system known as the retribution principle is broken. Um, That was the series two in the dialogues. He has refused to admit wrongdoing as the cause of his calamity. That was series three, cycle three, in the dialogues. He has proven that his righteousness is not founded on the expectation of reward. And in so doing, he has served well as the star witness for the defense of God's policies He has demonstrated that there is such a thing as disinterested righteousness. So the challengers claim that God's policy of rewarding righteous people was counterproductive and even subversive has been uh, cast aside. The friends who represented the challengers' case have been silenced, case dismissed. But now we make our transition through the wisdom interlude to the dialogue section. Chapter 28, um, again, as we talked about when we discussed the structure of the book, um, chapter 28 does not actually introduce a different speaker. and Therefore, it's easy to conclude that somehow Job continues to speak. As I mentioned uh, back in that segment, the problem is that the things being said in chapter 28 don't reflect very well at all on Job's actual uh, viewpoints expressed either before or after. So I look at this as the work of the narrator who is giving us kind of a, a uh, intermission, so to speak, uh, and transitioning us to a different way of thinking. So 28 verses 1 through 11 use the illustration of mining. Uh, and the basic thrust of that illustration is that mining brings hidden things to light. In verses 12 through 19, there are a number of rhetorical questions concerning wisdom, and it's suggested that wisdom is inaccessible to humans, yet beyond value and beyond human effort and ingenuity. Numerous indicators about what this is, um, sorry, say that again, Now, this is a cosmic discussion, and there are numerous indicators of that. Then the final segment of the chapter, 28 verses 20 to 28, God provides a path to wisdom, and the fear of God is the foundation for wisdom. So what are some of the the points being made? Uh, First of all, wisdom cannot be found, 28 to 12, but it comes from God. That's in 2820. So it contrasts the search, trying to find it, from the source. God is the one who gives it. Wisdom is found in the ordering of the components of the cosmos. And again, here we find an important connection between wisdom and order. This is true throughout the Bible. Wisdom is... Uh, is found when one goes about pursuing order and perceiving order and practicing order. Ordered world, ordered life, ordered society uh, are all those the pursuits of wisdom. And so wisdom is found in the ordering of the components of the cosmos. Order, it goes on to say, is not readily observable in daily operations but it was instrumental in the foundation of creation, and it is inherent in the ongoing operations. Job and his friends think that they know 
how the cosmos is ordered. The retribution principle is their operating theory. That equation, the righteous will prosper, the wicked will suffer, to them is how the world is ordered. But of course, that's not the case. And Job and his friends have not found true wisdom. When we look at verse 27, Then he, God, looked at wisdom and appraised it. He confirmed it and tested it. Here God approves creation by the criterion of wisdom, not by the criterion of justice. When Job and his friends tried to make the retribution principle the foundation of order, they were making justice the foundation of order in the cosmos. This frame, phrase by God turns that around and says, no, the foundation is not justice. He looked at wisdom and appraised it, confirmed it, tested it, approved creation by the criterion of wisdom. And so it gives us a little bit different perspective. Um, The equation that Job and his friends have used has been shown to be inadequate. The protagonists we've met so far, Job's friends, all have reputations as being among the wisest that the world has to offer. But when we think back through the dialogues, through their speeches, the fear of the Lord has not figured prominently in their comments. And here, that's what the book focuses on. Verse 28 is interesting in the way it sets up. It's instruction to humankind, Adam, when we read it. And he said to the human race, this is NIV, he said to the human race, that's Adam, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to shun evil, that is understanding. Now, This idea of fearing God, we can understand it pretty well by thinking about what it's contrasted to. Fearing God would be in contrast to thinking him detached and therefore to be ignored. Fear of God would be in contrast to thinking him incompetent and therefore to be treated with disdain. Fear of God would be in contrast to thinking him limited or impotent and therefore to be scorned. Fear of God is in contrast to thinking him corrupt and therefore to be admonished. Fearing God would be in contrast to thinking him short-sighted and therefore to be advised. Fearing God would be in contrast to thinking him petty, and therefore to be resented. Fearing God has this idea of taking God seriously. We need to do that lest we fall into any of those other traps of thinking of him as less than God. Now it's interesting that when this verse talks about the fear of God, It talks about the fear of Adonai, not the fear of Yahweh. This is a really interesting choice. It's not fear of Elohim. It's fear of Adonai. This is the only occurrence of Adonai in the book. Adonai in Hebrew can be used just to refer to an authority figure, um, whether it's a human or whether it's a god. Um, It's often used as a title for Yahweh, but often used in connection with Yahweh itself. So it's very interesting here that we have not fear of Shaddai, not fear of Elohim, not fear of Yahweh, but fear of Adonai. And it's also put in the mouth of God. This is God speaking. He said to the human race, the fear of Adonai, that is wisdom. So it's God himself speaking that way. Nowhere else in the Old Testament does God refer to himself simply by the title Adonai without some other label connected to it. So this is a really interesting 
choice of words here. This is part of what we do when we analyze text. We assume that the choice of words is meaningful, intentional, and purposeful. And so we consider them carefully. Now again, Adonai draws out the issue of authority. It has the sense of Lord or Master. And it draws out the element of submission to authority. That's something that's very needed in this context. Submitting to this God uh, by fearing him. So, unlike the similar saying in Proverbs, where the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, here, the fear of Adonai is wisdom. It's wise to trust God as the path to the wisdom. The definite form with a definite article is used both in verses 12 and 20. The wisdom. Fear of the Lord, then finally, is paralleled with an ethical exhortation to shun evil. It's not paralleled to ritual observance. So again, that's something that we need to be aware of. So what's the rhetorical role of chapter 28? First of all, it transitions us from the dialogues to the discourses. So it has that rather mechanical role. Second, it transitions from the challenger's contention, not a good idea to bring prosperity to righteous people, to Job's contention, not a good policy for righteous people to suffer. And the second part of the book is going to deal with Job's. Thirdly, it shifts the book from a search for justice to the source of wisdom and the understanding of the importance of wisdom in the equation. Job and his friends have left wisdom out of the equation as they understand order. It's been all about justice. But now it transitions to being all about wisdom. Fourthly, Job has demonstrated that his is a disinterested righteousness contrary to the challenger's suspicion. And so now we're ready to move on. The book has yet to deal with Job's challenge. So the question now that's on the table as we move into the the next section connected to Job's challenge is, can there be coherence when righteous people suffer? Okay? That's, again, in contrast to the challenger's contention, where the question was about disinterested righteousness. Here, can there be coherence when righteous people suffer? It serves notice that Job is not in the position of control and that his expectation should not dictate the direction in which this situation proceeds. God's wisdom rules. It serves notice that the friend's perception of coherence is flawed and simplistic. Following the friend's advice would not have brought coherence to Job's world. So, wisdom should be understood as that which brings order and coherence. God is the author of order and the foundation for coherence. But one would not speak of God himself alone as coherent or orderly. God was exercising wisdom when creating, but to say that God is wise understates God's nature. Just like we mentioned near the beginning of this whole course, the the idea that God is just somehow makes him seem contingent on some outside criteria. And it's the same thing here. Certainly God acts wisely. God is the source of wisdom. That's the most important connection. God is the source of justice, and God is the source of wisdom. So affirmations such as God is wise, or God is good, or God is holy, are misleading because the adjectives themselves actually find their definition in God. One may as well say that God is God. Any wisdom we might find has its foundations in him. The poem does not suggest that God is wisdom or that he has wisdom. 
We express our fear of the Lord when we trust Him with our circumstances, as uncomfortable or as confusing as they might be. We trust Him enough to accept that there need not be an explanation. We trust that His just nature is unassailable, even though there is no identifiable justice in the circumstances in which we find ourselves. We trust that he has set up the system in the very best, that means wisest, way possible, even when we are suffering the consequences of a system broken by the fall. We trust his love for us. We trust that even in our difficulties, he can show his love and strengthen us through the trials. Chapter 28 is one of the key chapters of the book. We need to attend to it carefully so that we glean its message. So it has a structural role and therefore a rhetorical role, but it also has a significant role in the theological message that the book has to present as it helps us to think about God in the right ways in relationship to the world. This is Dr. John Walton in his teaching on the book of Job. This is session number 17, conclusion of the dialogue series, Wisdom Interlude, chapter 28. 